Hello everyone and welcome to Marsden Mondays. I must uh, apologize because last week I did not drop a video. Very, very naughty boy. I was on the naughty spot. I actually did do a video, but it just looked so bad because I was on the road and I got my uh, just my phone and I was there and I was like, ah, no, I can't. I can't. They demand quality. My people demand good quality. So I thought right. I'd wait and, and invite my friend Michael Grumbine back again. Hello, Michael. How you doing, Matthew? Good to be so back. I have to, very good. And, and I have to say that just before we were going to do this um, video, we sat down because th this is these are the people we are. And I was like, I wish I had a whiskey. And Michael was like, I wish I had a whiskey as well. And I'm like, you know, we can do it. So that's cheers. Right. We are indeed adults. So here we are. Cheers. Oh, that's it. I don't cheers. know. Wash that. That was a little bit nasty, but. Hey, I've drunk worse, so cheers. <laughs> cheers, sir. I've actually got, normally I go for a Laphroaig, as you know, but uh, I had a Jura. That's a Jura right there. Very nice. All right. Like this that. is, for me, this is a the best of the local, the real local stuff. It's called Vessies here in in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, really, it's an excellent local whiskey. So, Well, I'm going to have to come there and drink it with you, aren't I? Indeed, you are. Yes. Indeed, you are. So um, people loved our last chat when we spoke about Tolkien, which was a yeah. lot of fun. I think we could have gone on forever. And we'll have to do it again. You have a lot of nerds on your uh, podcast. I love the, my the, nerds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm one too as well. I hate to exactly. say, but, but I am. Uh, but what I wanted to do was go back and talk about the other, well, one of the other things that you and I get into a lot sure. when we have our discussions is the Crusades. And more importantly, kind of the misconceptions and what people think about the Crusades. So let's just get into it. Okay, no problem. I'm glad we uh, we powered up with some bourbon yeah. beforehand. So I guess a little bit of background from my part. So my, ba my academic background is in medieval history, and uh, it's where what my master's is in, in my beginning of my PhD. And, um, and so... And I've over the years I've done a lot of talks about the Crusades. Uh, it came up a lot in my uh, classes when I was a teacher in a previous life. Now I'm in business, but uh, and then of course everyone always wants to know about the Crusades. Uh, very flamboyant, very in interesting period in history, and of course war being what it is, and religious war being a draw for a lot of people in terms of wanting to understand it, wanting to attack it, wanting to. Um, basically construe it in this way and that Hollywood has taken its turn at a lot of crusade movies, some of them worse, some of them better. And uh, so I found it to be a popular topic. People wanted to talk about I've given talks to a whole bunch of groups, including the um, existing survivors of a couple of, uh, of crusading orders. And we'll talk about that later on. So there's still some of the crusading orders, which are now essentially fraternal organizations across the world, in the, in, but they still exist in the Catholic Church. Uh, so uh, given some talks to them on the Crusades. So it's a topic I love. Uh, so anyway, with all that being said, so the Crusades, as probably anyone with Wikipedia would know, um, which is basically everyone, are, were a series of wars over about, a, the, the majority, the major ones were about over a 200 year period. So you're talking end of the 11th century, so 1095 to end of the 13th century, so 1290s, early 1290s. And there were a whole bunch of crusades and faux crusades, um, but of them, probably eight that are really distinct and large enough to be noteworthy as the big crusades. Um, there were a whole bunch of failed movements that were, tried to be crusades uh, and failed, but... Uh, and there were a lot of tiny ones in different areas after uh, the fall of the last Christian lands in the Holy Land in 1291. Um, but so most of the the crusading wars were fought in that 200 year period. So, Michael, oh. what defines a crusade? Like, what is a because because we use that as some kind of a reference yep. or a, a a a shorthand for saying you know we're going to go and do something. Right. right, like you're on a crusade to save this, or I'm on a crusade to do that. What does it actually mean? 
Right. So there's two questions there. One's the historical question and one is the sort of more common use of the term. So the historical question, a crusade is technically a religious war. So it's a war initiated by a religious authority and the, the crusades that we talk about were initiated by um, the Roman Catholic Church, sometimes called the Latin Church in the Middle Ages. And they were calls for a war against the Muslim occupation of the Holy Land. and sometimes also the Muslim occupation of parts of Northern Africa or Spain. So, so but the, the base definition is that this is a religious war initiated by a, a major religious leader. And because the Catholic Church is, has one of the most recognizable major religious leaders in the world, perhaps the most recognizable one, which is the Pope, um, the Popes, um, in general, the Popes all called the Crusades. And, um, and, and so that's, that's what makes a crusade historically. In common terms, it's basically means when, when you say, you know, so, so and so is on a crusade against, against, uh, drinking cheap bourbon, for example. Um, what you mean okay, is, I, I'm a part of that. I like that. I can join that crusade. Can we join crusade. that crusade? I can, I can get behind that one. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that just means obviously, um, it, a, an attack or a, a campaign that you have a strongly held sort of aggressive or militaristic belief based in something moral. So some, some, or in this case, in the case of our, our crusade against bourbon, um, against cheap bourbon, I should say. I was um, going to say, I'm it's, about to it's like, a, well, I suppose you could call jump it. Jump ship there. <laughs> Not against bourbon. Not real bourbon. So, so uh, yeah, just a, a, something that you're, you're undertaking, a fight you're undertaking in order uh, for a, a issue of principle or moral, usually moral or religious principle. So um, that's the usual, the, the more common term use of it. Now, of the eight crusades that I mentioned, um, I, I, tonight we probably should focus on just a couple because it's a huge area of history. So what I was thinking probably was worth focusing on most were the first crusade because it started them all off and the third crusade. But before I jump into anything like that, and you, you can give me your, your feedback on it, um, one of the things I should note is when I was in England uh, for, in my master's program in the University of Durham, back in 1999 and 2000, I um, had a, an advisor uh, who was, she was a um, medieval uh, lecturer and she, or which is a, uh, she wasn't a reader. She was almost a reader. So there are four levels of, of professor in England, as you know, um, Americans, we just call them professors, but uh, England, a professor is the highest of the four levels in England. So she was um, almost a reader. She had been many years studying medieval history. She was not a Christian, but she told me in one of our meetings where we were trying to decide what my, the topic of my uh, medieval master's uh, dissertation was going to be. We were going over some topics. She said to me, you know, Michael, there are two topics that are lied about more continuously than any others in medieval history. And th those are the Crusades and the Inquisition. And mind you, hmm. this, is coming, this is coming from a non-Christian saying this, and she was very fired up about that because people have a tremendous n amount of misconceptions about. about yeah, I, I, I had a complete misconception. I didn't about the Crusades, but I did about the Inquisition. I thought like everybody, I'm not going to go there because that's, Probably we'll have, to do another, another we'll have to do another one of these talks on the Inquisition. But, because, but uh, the fact that people just think that the Inquisition was what it was, it wasn't at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite staggering that that lie has been perpetuated for years and years and years, the way exa it was. Exactly. And it's been perpetuated because there are a number of people that have a healthy dislike of the Catholic Church. Um, mm -hmm. For better or worse reasons, and in and, and uh, so, but it's, it is the the Inquisition is kind of the whipping boy of history of medieval history, and the Crusades are a close second. So that's that's um, you know, as far as an intro goes, it's probably as far as we should de dig into. The so what style? Well, all right, let, let, let's get into the the meat and potatoes of it, shall we say? So what started it all? What kicked it all off, as it were? Right. Okay, and this is important. I'll get, I'll tell you the history of what kicked it off, and then I'm going to also um, insert a kind of um, uh, my own motives into this. And, and here's what I mean: um, one of the biggest misconceptions about the Crusades is that they were this sort of, you know, well, 
you, you have two two lines of thought on the Crusades that essentially either the Crusades were these bloodthirsty um, religious wars just about um, Catholics or Christians killing Muslims and that was the point of them um, and so they were this they, they were so, there were some so, some sort of religious fanaticism in military form that's lie number one lie number two is that there they were um, a basically a, a land grab, a get rich quick um, scheme, and the reason that these are lies, and by the way, this is kind of stuff has been perpetuated by by folks across all of our recent history. Um, you know, going back to the New York Times calling the Crusades um, comparable to Hitler's atrocities and the and or the ethnic cleansing of Kosovo. You have Bill Clinton when he was president. Uh, or actually, uh, sorry, right after he was president. So he was, is, this was following the September 11th attacks. Bill Clinton told uh, a Georgetown audience that he was uh, talking to that the Crusades constituted a crime against Islam. You had Barack Obama to say that, uh, you know, remind everyone after a prayer breakfast in, in 2015 that, that uh, he says, you know, basically don't get on your high horse and think this is our, we're, you know, Western civilization is unique. And remember that during the Crusades and the Inquisition, people committed terrible deeds in the name of Christ. Um, oh, politicians so... lied. <laughs> I am so shocked. <laughs> yep. Well, so, so it, yeah, shocking to nobody. But one of the things that's worth remembering is that in um, the, in the Middle Ages, at the end of the 11th century, you have at that point for about 400, between four and 500 years of the rise of Islam and this expansion of Islam. Islam had started in the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula, and it had spread by that time through fire and the sword for essentially 400 years. And it had spread and taken over all the Middle East. It had taken over... Um, most of the Byzantine Empire, um, in, which is now modern day Turkey, um, it was it had taken over Persia and Afghanistan and what we now call Afghanistan. Of course, it had taken Egypt, all of North Africa. It had it owned basically ninety something percent of what's now modern day Spain. It had invaded Europe and been pushed back only at great loss. Um, this was a force of of a religious force which had indeed engaged in um, in religious warfare for 400 years. And the Christians at this point were essentially doing everything they can just to survive and hold it off. Um, if you look at the landmass, the ancient Christian world was 65% conquered by Muslims by the time of the First Crusade. So, so you know, think of a modern day country and think, or, you know, Europe or any place and just think to basically two thirds of that has been conquered by a religious, um, religious warriors who are explicitly doing so in the name of, of spreading their religion. And um, now you have a good picture of the state of the uh, Christian Muslim relationship at the end of the 11th century. So what happens to set it off is something very specific. A um, you have a siege of the great Christian city of Byzantium, um, Constantinople, um, and the emperor of Constantinople, um, the Byzantine emperor at that time, Alexios Komnenos, uh, sends a request to the pope, and so you have Pope Urban II is the pope at that time. And he gets a request from from Emperor Alexios uh, to for help because basically the capital of the Byzantine Empire is about to fall, um, and these are to the Seljuk Turks. And one of the things you have to understand about uh, the the Islam uh, the forces of Islam in that time and the Muslim uh, nations at that time and kingdoms is that they there were a bunch of different ones. Um, these were the the, the Seljuks were the Persian Muslim um, kingdom uh, occupying what had been now occupying, having conquered from Byzantium, modern day Turkey and, and laying siege to their capital. So Urban II gets this, um, this 
basically this message, this request to please come and save us um, because because this ancient capital of of the church and of Europe is is going down. Um, in addition, at the same time or, or within that that sort of few decades of 1095, you had very specific persecution of Christians and Christian pilgrims that had begun in the Holy Land itself. And um, in 1077, you had an emir um, slaughter thousands of Christians and Jews when he captured Jerusalem. So Jer Jerusalem had fallen to, to the Muslim uh, forces in that region. And um, the Egyptian Fatimids, who were the North African um, or the East North African branch of the Muslims at that time, had uh, carried out wholesale destruction of all these Christian churches. And before that point, there was kind of this uneasy understanding that even though an area might be conquered by a Muslim a kingdom or, or ruler and become Muslim, there was you were still allowed to practice Christianity. You had to pay a severe tax, and there was a lot of um, so Jizya, dis right? discrimination. And yes, exactly. Uh, but they, um, but but you know, you could you could still practice your faith. Well, that changed in the late 11th century, and the Egyptian Fatimids and um, Ab the Abbasids in uh, the Holy Land who conquered Jerusalem just took to the wholesale destruction of churches and slaughtering of pilgrims. So they wouldn't even let the, the Christians. Why? What, what was the, what was the change? Like, why were they okay with it initially? And, and then yep. what did change? And I have one other question as well. Were the people, were the Turks that were, because you said there were Turks that were attacking Constantinople. So they were converts that yep. attacked Constantinople. So they yep. were basically overthrowing their own government as it were. Well, yeah, so the Seljuk Turks had come from areas outside of Turkey. They were called the Seljuk Turks. They're called the Seljuk Turks now, but they were they were a largely, you know, part Persian and okay. and they had come kind of sweeping down and they had defeated a lot of Muslim nations. One of the things that's worth remembering here and this is actually why the Crusader states lasted for uh, almost 200 years was that the Muslim kingdoms were much at war with each other as they were with the Christians. It wasn't a hmm. this, it wasn't an us versus them scenario. This is one of the other sim simplicities, um, simplistic un understandings of the Crusades. Which I did not know that. Have, my oh, yeah. at all. They, I did they, not know that. And that's true today, by the way. <laughs> yeah, more well. <laughs> more Muslims yeah. are killed by other Muslims today than yeah. than non-Muslims are. Um, they, you know, there's divisions, of course, Sunni Shia divisions, and a bunch of other. Subdivisions of the of the Islamic faith, and they have no love for it. No love is lost between uh, the, the various sects of Islam, um, and th the same was the case back in the uh, time of the Middle Ages. And so, so you have the Seljuk Turks, and they are Muslim, um, and they have been at war with everyone they wanted to. Essentially, their whole point was dynastic. They were just there to conquer, kind of in the. Uh, tradition, if you want to call it, of um, the future tradition of Genghis Khan. They were they were sort of the, for, the, the precursors to a Genghis Khan style. And they were, and I say that because they were fierce horse archers. Um, they had a style of fighting that Genghis, uh, the Mongols eventually, you know, came from the same, ultimately the same stock that produced the Seljuk Turks, but just many centuries later. So anyway, Seljuk Turks were a force to be reckoned with, and they had um, shockingly they had run up against the, they had in open battle in 1071, um, they had fought in the battle of Manzikert. They had crushed the Byzantine army and the Byzantines were a powerhouse and they had a very impressive um, armies and, uh, and the, the church just destroyed them and then proceeded to sweep through what's now um, Asia, most of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. So who, who destroyed who? Sorry, because the church destroyed the, them? The, no, this is the Seljuk Turks. Oh, the Turks. Okay, my apologies. So th these are the Seljuk Turks. These are the these are the Muslims in the north, um, in the northern part of the Holy Land or of the Middle East. Okay. So so anyway, so they're pressing against the the Byzantines who are about to fall. Constantinople is under siege and about to fall. You have the Christians um, who had the freedom to practice their faith, even if they were under the thumb of the the Muslim kingdoms in the Middle East and northern Africa and Egypt who now switched and they basically undertook a, a campaign, a harsh campaign of, 
of repression against Jews and Christians. Uh, mostly it appears for true religious and then somewhat for monetary reasons, because you can seize all of the, if you can seize all their stuff, then, then you, you, you get a, you get a, a boost in the, uh, in the, in the coffers for a time. The coffers, anyway. yeah. So, so it appears that, that, that there were, you know, some of the, um, some of the Muslims were, authentically on fire for their faith and some of them were doing it for other reasons for more mundane reasons again exactly the same as today in warfare you know like some people do it because they really believe it and others are right. profiteers right and now i and i want to point out i said at the beginning that this was a misconception that that's what the, why the crusades were fought um don't get me wrong there were a lot of crusaders plenty of them who were fighting because they very much wanted revenge against the Muslims for what they had done. Um, not condoned by Christianity, but that was a real, a, a real motivation um, for some of them. And some of them did commit atrocities. Um, by the, so did e literally everyone. And I have a fun fact for you when we get to the siege of Jerusalem. But, but literally every medieval army ever did this. The Christian crusader armies were no different. And what they're, they're, the, the atrocities, when they did occur, with the crusading armies from time to time, um, weren't even worthy of the Muslims complaining much about. The Muslim uh, historians of the time, they didn't actually complain very much about what the Christians did because it was pretty much par for the course in medieval warfare, which is if you lay siege to a city in medieval warfare, you give them a chance to surrender. And if they don't surrender and they hold out and your besiegers start um, dying of famine and 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 uh slowly starving to death because it's very difficult to get food after you were, you run out of food in the first couple months um for the surrounding areas um uh, in the middle ages then if if you lose you as the city lose against the besiegers it's understood that they're basically going to go on a rampage and slaughter you and take your stuff that yeah was, that happened that that happened sorry to interrupt you Marco no. that's what happened in the great siege of Malta in 1565 similar thing they they knew that if they were going to lose so they could have free passage right because i believe that happened with the knights of saint john in Rhodes that they gave them passage and it was incredibly exactly embarrassing right. for them uh that they walked out and gave up i mean that that's you know you you got to give it to them back in the day they actually had the courage of their convictions and they were like okay well i'm going to die here for what i believe in but it but yeah i mean that that was what the even in 1565, that they knew that they would all die if they lost. Right, exactly right. So they they had retreated from Rhodes uh, 40 years before and and gone to, and they made their stand at Malta and successfully held out until release. Which is was. another conversation for another yeah, time. Exactly, right? the siege so, of Malta. Sorry. Yeah, what, yeah. There's, it, so, there's it was, much it was, to talk about. Yeah, it, it was just understood. And I think a lot of people tend to look back at those periods. Number one, they're very selective. Right, they're very selective. Like you can look at the atrocities that, like you said, it happened with the Crusaders as well in yes. certain elements. Um, but also, it was a time where, as you just said, you were expected to die if you took the took the option of um, defending defending the city. And many of them were walled cities, right? That's why they did it. Exactly. So they knew. So they knew. I mean, we, we tend to look back in with, with our modern day vision of the way that we think we think things are now and kind of impress it onto the way it was back then, which is folly, really. It's it's really silly. You can't well, do it's that. A, yeah, it's one of those key mistakes that you make is you think that because your time has certain ethical um, rules, that that's what the people of a different time should adhere to. Um, and in and that's just first of all, it's just silly um, if unless you understand what people at the time were like. There have been also there through every age of history, people have tried to come up with codes of conduct that were acceptable. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Through many times in history, people had come up with uh, codes of conduct that were acceptable in warfare, for example. And if you want to truly, and if you think. Let me put it this way: If if anyone nowadays thinks that they were when they were living, uh, if they were living at that back back in the t end of the 11th century, that they would have done any differently than the, the typical soldier um, in those armies did, 
you're lying to yourself. This was, mm-hmm. this is, you're, you, we are no better than they were. And in fact, they had a pretty, some pretty specific codes of conduct that they were expected to adhere to in certain cases. And one of them was, for example, if you did su- attack a city, in the example we just gave, and they did surrender, you were not supposed, it was a, tr- a, a con- considered um, a, a basically uh, a, an act like akin to genocide today, if you went in and then slaughtered the inhabitants anyway when they were uh, surrendered to you. So the rule was if they surrendered, then you were supposed to treat them well. You could still take a portion of their um, as spoils, but you but you couldn't mistreat them. Um, and and whenever anyone surrenders to the Crusaders, there is no not a single instance of them ever mistreating the inhabitants when the inhabitants of a city uh, did surrender. So. So they're, you know, they, they, that's just one principle of medieval warfare, but, but, and there are, there are a few others, but back to the, the main point. So the main point mm-hmm. is you've got this first crusade that happens. Urban calls it, Urban the second calls it, and he calls across Europe for people to come. Now, this was a novel concept to Christians. Um, a crusade is somewhat akin to a military jihad call, call for military jihad. <clears throat> but the Christians hadn't done anything like this before. So it was a call to religious war by the highest religious authority. Um, and it was done. And here's where I want to emphasize the reasons given, which were stated explicitly, had to do with the fact that this was a, and this is going to sound funny to, to modern viewers, but you, you have to understand, this is actually and essentially a defensive war. Why? Because, as I said, for centuries, the Muslims had just been conquering, conquering, conquering. And so now the call, and they're about to conquer one of the key um, choke points in Europe, which is uh, Byzantium or Constantinople. And they're about to, that's the gateway to Europe. So Europe is going to be overrun if they take Constantinople, if the Muslims take Constantinople. And overrun from the southeast. So this was necessary it was necessary but as you know in warfare it's necessary to not just beat back attackers but then you need to take the fight to them to end the war you need to damage their ability to continue to attack you so it's done as a defensive uh, uh, an answer to a, a call for help a defensive call first of all second of all um it was considered a medieval right by all religions in the middle east that's jews muslims and christians all the major religions that pilgrims to a holy place were to be allowed to go and worship at that holy place, even if the controlling um, uh, polity and political rulers were of a different faith, because invariably they were going to be. So Jerusalem was an especially key point, obviously, as a holy city for three religions, the three these three major religions. And so they, um, the fact that the Muslims had breached this this tacit agreement, which had been the case even throughout centuries of war, and were now slaughtering pilgrims, was, again, the, the equivalent to a kind of genocide, and was viewed with as such by folks in the, even other Muslims um, condemned the treatment of the Christians in, in Jerusalem. Um, um, some of the uh, Fatimids, for example, uh, uh, condemned the Ubayid, um, ruler that uh, that uh, the emir that that perpetrated the atrocities so so you have this recognition that the core rights which is to go to the holy land and worship are being infringed and that and we may not take that seriously nowadays but they but everyone in, in the medieval world took that very seriously and well also just- michael you got to remember or the the audience has to remember this isn't just hopping on a coach and or even on a, I'm not going to say on a plane because but I mean even on a coach and traveling throughout Europe all the way down uh, to the Holy Land I mean this is right a arduous brutal journey for anyone that is on their way down to to Jerusalem I mean yeah. it, it's and it's hard many people the, the the thing to do if you went to on a pilgrimage in the old days was uh, first <clears throat> put your will in order because it was a good chance you weren't coming back. Um, and, and, you know, put all your affairs in order, um, get your stuff lined up and for whoever was going to take over your estates, you know, get them, get them, um, and your property, get them in charge 
and then leave and you say goodbye to everyone as if you were saying you don't you 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 would never see them again because oftentimes that was the case very often um so so the fact that people were willing to do that across Europe across the Middle East across Africa and visit Jerusalem um there was this understanding that they would be allowed to 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 do so and visit in peace um cuz i mean but there were a hundred ways for you to be killed um on the way to 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 the holy city but now that the holy city is closed that's viewed as basically an act of war for for um by the christians especially and then in the east sorry in the west in what's now modern day spain you have an, another group of um of uh, uh muslims that are that are moving up the spanish coast and and uh this is the almorad um emirate and they are um, they're conquering Spain. So um, in, while the Crusades were sent, m- many of the Crusading armies were sent to the Holy Land because that was the kind of the, the, the center point of the Crusades. Um, there were also plenty of Crusaders that went to Spain, modern day Spain, Leon and Castile and Aragon, and, uh, and f- to fight the, fight the Muslims there and basically engage in defensive warfare. Like you got to beat them back because they were the, the Muslims were the aggressors in this case. And, and in North Africa, what was their motivation? Was that a religious thing or was that land? I mean, yes, what did they it was want? Both. It was, it was both, both religious and land. So, but, but primarily this is a land, this is land. Um, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the Muslims or you're talking about the Crusaders. Yeah. The Muslims going up through North Africa okay. into Spain. Yep. That's, that's a land. I mean, they're, they're, they're given accolades for doing so in the name of Islam as well. So there's a, there are plenty of religious uh, soldiers and re- there's a religious element to this um, for the Muslims, but it is, it's pretty, it's pretty clearly, you know, conquest. Um, and that's the, that's the point of it. And it wasn't as if, unlike the Crusades, who are fighting to take back what used to be Christian lands, because remember all the Seljuk Turks that have taken over the uh, 70, 80 percent of the Byzantine Empire in the last 50 years. These are Christian lands they've taken over. And so the, the Crusaders are fighting to get those back. And so this this is this is not a, a case of like, you know, Crusaders just going and conquering territory and claiming it as their own. Um, as they went through, when when the Crusaders went, um, most of them did um, go first to Constantinople. So this first crusade in 1096, they actually get it underway, and they travel to Constantinople, which anyone that wants to, to can pull up a map and take a look at. It's a it's at this choke point um, going mm-hmm. from Europe to to uh, Asia Minor, and and so they meet with the emperor. He they uh, um, make him promises because uh, sometimes the Byzantine Empire fought against the Christian kingdoms as well um, when they weren't fighting the. the uh, the Seljuk Turks or any of the other Muslims um, on their borders because the Byzantine Empire, well, although it was Christian, you know, people fight for all kinds of reasons. So the Crusaders make, they swear an oath. They're not going to, um, they're not going to take and hold for themselves uh, Byzantine, former Byzantine land. They're just there to free it. And they cross over and they go um, and, and sp- essentially much of the first crusade was a campaign to, to uh, free um, the former Byzantine, e- Eastern Byzantine Empire from uh, the Seljuk Turks. And there's a lot of cool battles that happen. And I say, I call them cool battles because they're, you know, remember, these are the Seljuk Turks who have beaten the the, the powerhouse of a military, the Byzantine Empire. They have also beaten a, a series of um, Muslim kingdoms in their conquering of uh, parts of Iran, what's now Iran and, and Asia Minor and northern uh, the Northern Arabian Peninsula. So the Celtic Church are, are, a, are a force to be reckoned with. And the Crusaders in their armies come over and they're on their way to the Holy Land. So they're kind of marching across modern day Turkey, taking city after city, and they're getting harassed and attacked continuously by these Seljuk Turks. And some of these battles are really impressive where um, the Crusaders basically showed that they were just made of sterner stuff than 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 any of the Byzantines or the other Muslims or the Seljuk Turks because they kept their discipline and they fought the way you need to fight against uh, a Mongol what would eventually become a Mongol like tactic of of sweeping 
arms of caval horse archers and cavalry that just run circles around you, um, showering hundreds of arrows at you. And then once you're soft enough, come in for these lightning charges. And then when you try to come after them, they run away and they string you out and then they sweep back around. And when you're thin, they, they crush you. And it's a very effective tactic in medieval warfare. It worked against everyone. The most of the crusaders in the first crusade are Franks. So these are the, you know, the people that would be back when the French could fight well. Yeah, I, I'm not going to say anything about the French. I'm not. Saying, you were waiting for that, weren't you? I'm not going to say anything about the French. Waiting. I was waiting. So, so you got these. Um, you you have these uh, Frankish. Uh, but well, here's what's funny. There's five major princes that run and and lead the um, first crusade. Uh, a couple of them are not from from France. What's now France, actually, or even northern Spain. They're actually from Sicily. So these are Sicilian. I mean. And why? Because the Normans came over and conquered portions of Sicily at this time and had established their own kingdoms. And then a couple of the major ones end up um, leading part of the Crusades. And they just conquered England just before that, right, in 1066. So, I mean, they were... These are are the scions of uh, William the Conqueror and his his kind. And they, they uh, they were warriors born and bred. And they were also, they had exactly, they knew what they were up against with they have been told extensively by the byzantines so they so they planned for how to fight the turks and the plan was simply this don't die for a long time line up in your lines keep your shields interlocked form boxes so that so so that if the um if they get too close the turks get too close you can do damage but outlast them and then when they're out of arrows um you know, do some damage and then and and kill as many as you can and then keep marching. Don't go after them. It's very them. Roman. It's a very it's a very Romanesque tactic, right? Yep. And the Franks, these were these were hard men. These the uh, and and they in this first crusade, the Franks became almost uh, they were they became like objects of legend. And if you were on the other side, the Muslim side of terrifying legend, because what they were able to accomplish in this first crusade should never have been able to happen from their numbers. So you're only talking about at two, about 50,000 men total that, that made it over to invade. And they proceeded to march across Anatolia, which is the modern day Turkey, and take back major city after major city. And once they reached the far east side of Anatolia, they set up the first of the Crusader states, these little kingdoms. And they had to because they had to have a base of operations with which to move down and and um, free the Holy Land and free Jerusalem, which was, of course, their ultimate target. Their target in the first crusade was free Jerusalem, you know, take back the Byzantine um, territory that's been uh, conquered and then work your way down and free Jerusalem and then stop. And how they- long... How long did that take from the moment that the Pope called for the crusade for them to, four, to get to four years? To con- wow. So so there there it took a while, most of a year to gather and then and move and everything moves slowly. And of course, there's all kinds of shenanigans that happen. There's a fake crusade. There's the Peter the Hermit um, who led this rabble of a crusade. And, you know, and he went over first and he wasn't a real crusader. He was some foe. He was a kind of a Rasputin kind of character in the Middle Ages. And uh, he got about a, he got about 10,000 of the of the common folk to from what's now Germany and uh, to follow him. He led them to their doom. Essentially, they crossed over and tried to take um, the first uh you know a, a city in um in uh, anatolia right over the the water from constantinople and proceeded to get s- surrounded and slaughtered by the turks by the seljuk turks and um so then then the crusader armies came uh, a few months later and uh and did the right thing and so so they proceeded to march across they freed byzantium they started to set up um what's it looks like Outremer to our my American said, but it's pronounced Utremer. So Ut- Utremer, which are these groups of uh, the the Crusader states, and um, in in uh, in northern the northern Levant between basically Lebanon and and um, other areas. So they they set up major bases in Tarsus and uh, Edessa and Antioch and Tripoli, and then finally made their way down to Jerusalem. And there were some there were some amazing exploits where they you know they 
worthy of worthy of someone should make some movies about the first who crusade. led them who were the leading is there any individuals yep. Yep. in particular so, so i mentioned five so you have uh godfrey of bouillon who came from uh lorraine and his older brother baldwin of bouillon and um and then there's and so he's from the german side now alsace lorraine as as people probably know or might know or maybe not is a mid region between modern day France and Germany. So you have as we know from the Second World War. Exactly. Right? So I mean, you have the yeah. even at this time in the Middle Ages, you have the admixture of the Germanic people. I mean if the Franks, let's face it, the Franks are basically a, a, a Germanic tribe. Yeah. Um, um that would then later become become uh, their own ethnic group, so to speak. But uh so you have two brothers, you have Godfrey and Baldwin from that Alsace Lorraine region. You have um an uncle and a nephew from Sicily um, that's Beaumont is his name, Beaumont of Toronto and Tancred of Houteville, um, Houteville. Um, and they're both from Sicily. They're, they're these princes that have conquered pieces of Sicily and are now um, uh, inspired to take up and free the Holy Land and, and head off there. Now, from their perspective, there's definitely no way that you would say that these guys were not were opposed to, to taking land. The, the, right. the, the Franks were well known for that. But the bulk of their army was not was not um, uh, um, these the was not of the same kind, and they were not going to be prom they were not being promised um, all this land. They were there for religious and defensive reasons. They were they were essentially taking up. Um, in fact, Urban uh, Urban, you know, when he calls the crusade, he even says that he he holds out to them. He, in his papal bull, he says, "I hold out to you the promise of martyrdom." <laughs> essentially, essentially, you're all going to die. You're going there to die. Um, so, yeah. so Michael, let me ask you this because I know this is a little maybe I'm preempting something, but I, I think it's important sure. when we start talking about the motives behind people doing this. Yes, can you explain what a plenary indulgence is for those that do not know? Okay, sure. Um, so and in, what that means, in, you know, because a lot of people will go, and I know that kind of comes under, under the misconceptions, but, you know, because people go, well, you know, they promised that, you know, that you would get X, Y, Z. I'm not going to preempt it. I'm mm -hmm. glad to see you finally got a, a sip of whiskey <laughs> because I was like drinking on my own Cause there. Because I'm, I'm talking too much. That's why. <laughs> yeah, quick, quick, get it in. But a lot of people will, again, it's one of those phrases that they just throw out there. Well, you know, they were promised. Blah, blah, blah. What did what does that mean? And please put it in context of what was going on and how anyone kind of doing that for nefarious means would not get it. Exactly, exactly. So an indulgence in the Catholic, and you know, uh, you're probably going to get a, 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 some some Protestant comments in the in this video about this. That's but, okay. That's but, okay. They're, they're Protestants, brothers and sisters. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So. So an indulgence is the Catholic Church, the Catholic belief is that um, we're all sinners, and as sinners, we, you can receive forgiveness of sins through the sacrament of confession, but there is there remains um, an effect on you and on your soul, basically, of sin from commit the committing of sin. No one, no one can commit a bunch of sins and be untainted. And we kind of know this from human psychology. The more bad you do, it does, in fact, affect you psychologically. Even people that aren't spiritual will, will admit that. So the Catholic Church held that there were things that you could do in order to relieve or, or remit the penalty for your sins in purgatory. Um, but in order yeah, to going to just say that's a lot of Protestants are like, I don't believe that, I don't believe that, I don't believe that. But that's a conversation for another time. Exactly. So if for any of my any of so, my Protestants or atheists, just put a pin in that. <laughs> right, don't be hating because we're just explaining it. Yep. All right. So we're we're just explaining the Catholic perspective. And by the way, the Catholic perspective is the Christian perspective. So there were no Protestants at this time. This is what everybody all Christians believe. So they believe at that, that point, yeah. That that at this point you were talking about the end of the eleventh century, you had you had the general Christian belief that in that you you still had to work you still had to to um uh remit that penalty for your sins in some way now you could do so you could do that by living a good life and enduring the sufferings that you're given in life um well um or you could do something extraordinary like a pilgrimage 
or or in this case become a crusader and you if you did so with a clean heart then you could receive a plenary indulgence which meant that all of the remission there was a remission of all of the penalty due to sin um in your life if you died immediately after that and and, and let me just clarify something that doesn't mean you earn grace nope Nope. Okay. It's, because a lot of people think, oh, that's what it is. You, you, you can work it and you can earn grace. That's not what it is. Correct. And uh, as you mentioned, this is a very deep theological topic. So, but, but the mm -hmm. point is, let me, from an historical perspective, this was, there was an understanding that if you, if you um, set out and gave your life to a tremendously holy cause, in this case, the defense of Christendom, which was under attack and about to fall, in both Spain and, and Constantinople, which means that probably the rest of Europe was going to follow, then you could, in fact, earn an indulgence. But you couldn't do so if you were in your... Only God knew whether you had earned it or not, by the way. Nobody, nobody is going to claim, was going to claim that they knew that you weren't going to, you know, all your sins have been remitted, the pen, penalty due for all your sins. And yeah, nobody been knows. No, you, nobody you knew except know. you and you God. Don't. But if yeah. you were... If you were pure of heart, if you were doing it for for um, morally upright reasons, then there was a spiritual reward that came from that. So that is one of the major causes from a lot of folks that knew they had done great wrong. And this was an era of history where there was a lot of great wrongs being done across Europe. Um, and not to say that our time and place is any different, but uh, but back then, um, you know, it, it was a brutal world, and so a lot of these a lot of these soldiers, a lot of these crusading knights. Um, were in fact doing so this as an act of humility. This was like a military pilgrimage of, of a kind. So they could they could put their life on the line uh, for for Christendom and for the defense of Christ, of of Christians who were under attack by a, by an aggressor. And if and if they um, if they accomplished their aim or died in battle, then they could be granted a, a plenary indulgence. And, so yes. and one of the things that people as well another misconception is, as you said, that there was going to be some kind of financial gain when actually many, many, because they have the records of this, right, Michael, you can tell, they, they mortgaged their homes. They they didn't know. It was families. They didn't know if they were going to come back. You had fathers with sons and uncles. I mean, there, there were whole families of men. The men in the families would go on these crusades. Yep. Leaving every, there was no other way for them to earn money or or bring anything back, they would they would mortgage their property so exactly, they could go. Exactly right. This was th there was no faking this. This was it, it was an ex super expensive proposition to outfit yourself with arms, bring men at arms if you could, if you had a, a person of means. But if you weren't, you're just outfitting yourself with supplies, with weapons, and you were selling everything basically in order to make your or much of what you owned in most cases. So you're talking 95 plus percent of the crusaders, they never got any reward for this. No, 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 um, uh, no major spoils of war, no land. There were, there was a small portion that did, um, as there always is in, in medieval warfare. But, but most of the people that are going there, they're leaving their homes. Like you say, they are saying goodbye to their wives. Oftentimes, um, their children and are never seen again. Um, sometimes, if you're very wealthy, you might try to bring your your family with you. Uh, didn't work out well most of the time. Let's put it that way. Yeah, can you imagine that? That would be a disaster. Like nothing like a distraction like your family. You want to be <laughs> single minded. Yep. I, no, I mean that tr truthfully. It's like anything. If we were going to go off and and go to war, you don't you don't your little kids there and your wife. I no, mean, no, that's... you don't bring your wife into your your family into battle in, or even near the battle. So so you say goodbye and you go. Um, and and you expect in the medieval in, in the first crusade especially it was it was seen as fairly very likely you weren't going to return um, and that was true for most of them actually of the uh, roughly fifty thousand that made it to Constantinople in the form of an army spoiler alert by the end of the first crusade about eight thousand were left um, and that that took Jerusalem. Uh, Nine thousand that took Jerusalem, and then they, about a thousand more died in the in the immediate subsequent attack after taking Jerusalem by the Egyptians, Fatimids. So anyway, so you got these five Franks, and uh, the the last one I haven't mentioned is uh, Raymond or Ramon of Toulouse, and he um, 
his uh, his superpowers like Batman, he was rich, so he funded most most of the First Crusade. So you got um, these five princes, these Frankish princes, who are all um, the they are the they are the leaders of the of the First Crusade. Um, as the Crusaders worked their way across Anatolia and down the Levant, and so they set up Crusader states in the major after after taking major cities. And one after another of these um, of these five went and and uh, uh, basically, you know, became the rulers of these lands to hold it as a supply line from the Byzantines, so they could keep passing down supplies as the Crusaders were moving down uh, down the uh, down the coast of the Levant. So there's a massive. Uh, before they get to the Levant proper, there's Antioch, which is a city that had never been taken. Um, and after, there was a seven-month siege where the crusaders outside of that city of Antioch, um, who were besieging the city, fought off two separate Turkish relief armies. And then they had seven months of starvation. They finally, with the help of an Armenian guard, um, got into the city and opened one tower and then used it um, to, to, um, <clears throat> to take the city. And uh, and then they were pr promptly besieged the next week, I think, by uh, a, a, an army from uh, Mosul. Um, the the Turkish, the Seljuk Turks' name was Kerboga, and he was a uh, he was a, a, a nasty piece of work that has been hadn't been fighting the Crusaders. He'd been fighting in the east to the other um, some of the other Muslims, and so he came and laid siege to them. And uh, but he was beaten back, and then they left Antioch. And uh, but they're terribly diminished by starvation. Um, and by the way, the beating back of Kerboga's army is is one of these scenes that should be in a movie somewhere. The Crusaders are who have just been starved and besieging Antioch, and they've just barely taken Antioch, and then now they're being besieged. They they are starving to death. And then one of them has a vision. One of Raymond's um, men. This is the rich rich guy Raymond. Um, has a vision of the holy lance that was said to have pierced the side of Christ, and so they dug in some place that that they the, the vision was uh, um, uh, the, has supposedly pointed them towards, and they they dug up something that that uh, they claimed was the holy lance, and uh, they emerged. So then they decided this is a sign that we're going to win against this force that outnumbers us five to one. So. They uh, they fasted for five days. They decided they were going to huh. fast, fast for five more days and then go out bearing the Holy Lance at, at a five to one loss. They're going to go leave the citadel and charge the, the, the Turks. And um, the Turks, there's this funny record of the Tur from a Turkish historian who said that the Turks all reported that there were all these angels fighting on the side of the uh, of the Christian knights. But anyway, the the point was they broke this fresh army that outnumbered them five to one, and drove them off, and then they moved down and and um, uh, so uh, Bohemond, who is the older Sicilian Frank, uh, stayed uh, in Antioch and formed the Second Crusader State, um, and then they the at that point his uh, nephew had already set up the first. Odessa, which is the first Crusader state, by marrying an Armenian princess, and uh, and and as their bulwark, you know, to the northeast, essentially the Crusader bulwark and supply line there. So now you're down to three of the five rulers: the two guys from the Alsace-Lorraine region and Rich Raymond. Um, and and they move down the Levant. They attack and conquer a bunch of other cities, and they finally make it to Jerusalem. Um, and then by the time they reach Jerusalem, they have 12,000 troops left of the original 50,000. And of those 12,000, only about 1,400 are knights. The rest are, are minute arms and, and, you know, they're, they aren't the crusaders that you see in the pictures. So, they're, so you got about 1,400 knights left. The city at that point, um, the uh, city of Jerusalem was said to have 40,000 fighting Muslims in it. So you got this 12,000 troop army trying to blockade a, a city with 40,000 troops in it. Obviously, it's not going to work. And, and so they couldn't even partially blockade the city. So they had to just um, assault the walls kind of hopelessly. Um, in July of nine, uh, 1099, they assault the walls. They fail. Um, 
and then a, a, a squadron of Christian ships lands in Jaffa, um, which has been their, you know, there's, there's, the Christians came in different waves um, and they land in Jaffa and they get, so the crusaders besieging the city of Jerusalem get resupplied. But the Christians who land in Jaffa say, by the way, um, right behind us coming up the coast is the Fatimid Muslim army, um, <laughs> which is huge from Egypt. So the Fatimids are the Egyptian Muslims. And uh, so, so y'all's um, tiny army, which is outnumbered in this, in this siege of Jerusalem, is about to get attacked from behind by an even larger Muslim army. So the Crusaders took their supplies and did one more massive assault. And they hastily built those equipment. They assaulted the walls. And after a bloody assault, they break through. So these are, and so, so at this time, um, they're down to less than 10,000 men. And um, that is the point at which Jerusalem is sacked. And this is the infamous sack of Jerusalem, much maligned in the history books, which you probably read about when you were in uh, in uh, secondary school or high school. And um, they, uh, they then, um, it, what's interesting about the slaughter that happened uh, of the civilians, because there was a, there was a sacking and a slaughter of, of some innocent people. Um, here's what I find funny about this. There are three peoples. Sorry, that's a, that's the wrong term. I don't find the slaughter of innocents funny, just so your audience knows. But there are three separate sets of records about how many people were killed in Jerusalem at that, in, during that assault, after that assault. Um, those records were the records of, there's Islamic records of how many people the Crusaders supposedly killed. There were Crusader records of how many people they supposedly cr killed. And there was a third party. So who's the third party living in Jerusalem at that time? Not Christians, not Muslims. Jews. So the Jews kept other records. And here's the funny thing. The Muslims claimed that 70,000 people were killed. That seems unlikely since there was, they had sent away the non-combatants and there were, by their own records, there were only 40,000 fighting Muslims. So, so it's kind of hard to kill more people than exist in the city. You know, maybe there's 50,000, including some, some folks hanging on. But essentially, they're claiming that they slaughtered everybody, which is impossible because there's all kinds of records and stuff coming out of there. So that number is grossly overestimated and people, historians all agree on that. The Christians say they slaughtered that about 10,000 innocents or, or, or people inside were slaughtered that had surrendered, which is bad. The Jews say it was three to 5,000, depending on which Jews. So Innocents. In, yeah, basically people that had surrendered. Now, not, not their own, not the Jews that had surrendered, but Muslims that had surrendered. Um, uh, well, in, actually, Muslims and Jews um, that had surrendered. But here's the thing. Let, let me ask you this, Michael. Yep. They didn't surrender though before. So no, no. under the terms of the under the understanding of medieval warfare, this was totally normal. Let me tell you something. Within within a one year period, well, sorry, three year period. Within a three year period of the sack of Jerusalem, much maligned in Western history. If the let's let's take the middle number. Let's say the Jews who have no reason to lie about the number of innocent killed because they were among them. Um, let's say they were wrong. And we go with the Christian number. The Muslim number is grossly, grossly over. So 10,000. So let's say 10,000. Muslim armies within three years of this battle, the sack of Jerusalem, and this is a tiny portion, three-year window in 1099, a tiny sliver of medieval history. There are battles all the time, things, people being attacked, cities being attacked all the time. Within a three-year period of the sack of Jerusalem, the three different Muslim armies sacked cities, one of them Christian in the in the um, Crusader states, two of them other Muslim sacking Muslims. So just for the record, you know, within that window of time, they killed more people than than the Christians killed in sack of Jerusalem. And nobody so knows, it, nobody knows the names of those cities or battles. So I do, but it, it's there's these yeah, it's, there, the, because it doesn't make the headlines. Because nobody right? Even cares. Back then, it doesn't matter because exactly. it doesn't forward any propaganda. So so let me ask you this. So if, they, if the Muslim records say that there are 70,000 people killed, and so it couldn't be 70,000 innocent people, right? Because that would have to include the army plus the other people. Right. So here's why, what I mean by innocent. I'm, I'm using actually a modern you, term. You know what I'm saying? You, you've, you, called, you've called it out. Yeah, you've called it out accurately. Once the city's overrun 
everyone inside people that used to be soldiers and people who are never soldiers are all surrendering okay yeah they're all the but same if, but from a medieval perspective it's too late you 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 fought you did not you did not agree to to surrender in the beginning and so so you will be sacked that is what happens when when medieval cities get overrun in medieval warfare the christians are not some sort of you know crazy fanatics that are that are out for blood in a, in a way that's any different from anyone else in, in the, at that time in history. So you knew you were going to get... But let me just ask you this, but, but if you're a Jew back then, you're not down with this either. Like, nope. So, you, you know, you're nope. not fighting. No. Nope. So you truly are the ones like, uh, I'm stuck in the middle of here with these two groups fighting, right? And, and, and the reason I point out the Jewish number is the Jews have no reason not to exaggerate except their own sense of integrity because they're just getting killed no matter what. Okay, they're not mm-hmm. fighting against the Christians, at least most of them. Maybe there were some Jews that, you know, were, were in, this, in the militia in the city, who knows, but, but unlikely. And, and so they're not, so, so they have no reason to downgrade their numbers. They, so the fact that they, who are meticulous, t- the, the Christian numbers were just estimates. Nobody went, uh, not nobody went through and counted. There were some counting done, but it wasn't extensive in the way that people would consider proper casualty counting nowadays. Um, the Jews had the closest thing to that, and they came up with at most 5,000. So I'm actually, as an historian, more inclined to believe the more sober number of the Jews, the, the third party that had no reason to downgrade their number. To lie. Oh, to lie. They yeah. had no reason so, to lie. So, but even if you take double their number, which is the supposed Christian number, because, let me be clear about this, the Pope condemned the sack of Jerusalem. This was not okay with the Catholic Church. The sacking itself and the killing of innocents, he condemned. Even though it was an understood principle of medieval warfare, the church was actually wanting to be something better at, at that point and to, to this day. And so he he um, condemned the killing of the innocents after the battle was over. Um, so, so, yes, but yes, there were atrocities uh, permitted. So from a military perspective, however, your job's not done because now you have Jerusalem and now there's a Fatimid army right on your doorstep of Egyptian Muslims. And so they, they, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the Christians are immediately besieged again. And this time the, the, the Fatimids arrive and these Egyptian Muslims have between 30 and 50,000 uh, troops. It's, there's differing reports. So now Godfrey of Bouillon, um, leads this uh ramon was sick and, and he actually got injured so rich guy was injured um godfrey's basically the last guy standing of the five uh godfrey of, and he leads the remaining nine thousand eight to nine thousand men out of the city of which only a little over a thousand are knights um and they do that thing which crusaders had become infamous for which is they face an army that is at this point so you got basically, let's say 40,000 fresh Muslims from Egypt against 9,000 um, half-starved, just been fighting horrible, horribly for weeks, um, army, and they charged. And they broke the uh, Muslims and defeated the entire army. And, wow. Uh, and conquered. Did you say wow or how? Yeah, I said wow, but I'd like to know how, if you can tell me, but wow nobody, and how. Well, nobody can nobody tell knows. you. Nobody knows. I have my, I have my, um, I have things I can say about that, but he, so here's what I can say. The Frankish soldiers had proved themselves to be the cream of the crop of medieval, the medieval world at that time. Like they were, these guys were like the, they, it was like an army of, well, the knights were like, like basically the today's guys. special, special, special forces. Um, they were unreal. Uh, there's a, in the third crusade, there was this un- incredible scene where the crusaders have taken Acre and they are moving um, down to Jaffa and then they're going to go across and try to retake. And this is now. I, I'm now talking about the Third Crusade, so I'm jump, we're jumping ahead a hundred years, and because um, Jerusalem has been reconquered um, uh, by Saladin, um, well, we call him Saladin now, but um, you know, so so he was the the Muslim superstar a hundred years later, and uh, Richard Lionheart leads this force down um, through these orchards, uh, this orchard town called Arsuf, and they get attacked by Saladin's forces. 
And there are these stories from the Muslim historians where basically the English would just sit there, there, uh, well, at these points, it's, it's Frank's, you know, Frankish English knights, but the ones led by Richard Lionheart would, they would, the Muslims would fill them with arrows. Their sword, their shields would be full of arrows, their backs, they would be shooting in. Their layers of armor were so thick. They had multiple chainmail layers. They would just wait and get shot. And then they, they they would turn to each other and they use their swords and they would hack down and break off all the arrows sticking out of them and out of their shields. And they would go back into formation and then they would charge. Like these guys were were hardcore and the Muslims developed a very healthy um, opinion of the crusading knights um, of the of Europe um, in the net in, during that hundred years. They were they were incredible and they were just tougher stuff than anyone else around, even on the other Christians, even the, the, the Byzantine soldiers and the other arm, you know, the other uh, warriors of Europe. So anyway. So this that's that was jumping ahead to the third crusade. Anyway, we, we went a long time and I'm sorry for all the uh, you know, I, I droned on. No, I love it. I think I think that what we should do, I am gonna ask you a couple of questions before we Go tie up. But I think what we'll do is because this is fascinating to me, and I hope that people are finding it fascinating as well, is we'll come back and we'll do maybe we'll do the third the, other ones. the third crusade. But let me yeah, yeah. Let, let me hear your questions and I'm gonna leave then I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it on a certain thought, which is one of the one of the filters that we have to ask and people have asked is were the crusades just wars were they wars that were defensible from a even from a somewhat modern perspective as just wars and there are principles of just warfare that we as in western civilization hold even following the geneva convention and other uh, and and you know measures of the united nations and all we hold that you know principles that need to be met standards and criteria that need to be met in order for a war to be considered just. And I can, I, I'd love to, maybe we'll close with this, or maybe we'll, we'll do this after the next um, session, but talk about what those four principles are. I, I, let, let's talk about it just quickly. Let, let's get through it if we can. Sure. Yeah. And it's important. Yeah, and, so, and, and, and where it started, where the idea started. Right. Okay. So the idea of the, of, of a just war comes actually from it's a very medieval. There's a very medieval tradition around this it, 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 that was developed um, following the, the, the Crusades, not as a consequence of the Crusades, but in other words, it was Aquinas in the 1200s, and then following him, the scholastic tradition. But what they were doing was they were taking principles from from um, early Christianity and applying them to the world, um, it, and the and the world of even of violence and self defense. So. Our ideas today about things like self-defense and capital punishment and the morality of warfare when it is moral and when it is not, these actually come from Thomas Aquinas and his, his excellent treatment of it. Our laws, we can, even the laws about when a, when a police officer, for example, is allowed to use what and what kind of force they're allowed to use come from Aquinas. Definitely our just war theory comes from Aquinas. So, so um but it's been ex explicated and developed over the ages by by Chris, by first by Christendom and then Western Europe, and now you have full, basically six principles. But the first two are easy to talk about because it, a, a just war has to be called by a rightful authority, and it has to be promulgated properly. So that's that's the kind of thing which tends tends to be assumed in today's world. There are four other principles that are of worth considering about what makes a just war according to the European tradition. And those are that the damage inflicted by the aggressor on, you know, if you're a it, it, wars, essentially all just wars have to be, have to be a defensive in nature. You're not allowed to just go conquer people because you want to. Um, but the damage inflicted by the aggressor um, has to be lasting, grave, and certain. So you can't go to war just because, uh, and, and, you know, just because someone launched a few missiles at you, I know people get upset about that, but you, you're not allowed to actually go to war according to the Christian tradition just because that something like that occurs. You have to, the damage has to be lasting, grave, and certain. Um, the second principle is that you have to show um, that other methods of avoiding or ending the war, that's a, the aggressive war, have failed. So you have to try for some kind of peace, although that peace can involve giving back of the land that was unjustly taken. But you you have to make overtures. You can't just immediately go and kill everybody that was attacking. So the church says, and the Christian tradition says, you, there has to be um, other means tried um, for peace beforehand. 
The third principle, and this is an interesting one, and it kind of goes, it flies in the face a little bit of Americans, the American spirit. Uh, and, and I say that as a, as a, a, a red-blooded American. The third principle of a just war is you have to have a serious prospect of success. So you cannot go to war suicidally just because it, even if it was unjustly put on you, um, if you, you're going to war suicidally and there's really no chance of success, you are not allowed to legitimately go to war because all you're doing at that point is throwing your life away and causing the death of innocents because that's what always happens in war is the death of innocents. Um, so, so that's, that, that's a, a major principle of the just war. And the fourth principle is, and this is an interesting one because it requires a kind of analysis of the situation in question. The use of arms can't produce evil and disorder graver than the evil that you're trying to eliminate. So, so if you go in and if someone takes over your territory unjustly, and you meet the first three criteria, but going to war with them would um, absolutely wreck everything, then you cannot um, engage in a just war. And that, by the way, would be an argument against the use of ap ap apocalyptic nuclear like war. Like nuclear weapons. Yep. I, th th that's exactly what I was just thinking, because I was sitting there and I'm like, oh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm. That's an argument. Yep. And, and, and there's real problems with the just war principles with analyzing the use of nuclear weapons. But let me say that if you read accounts of World War I before nuclear weapons were produced and the artillery barrages that they use, they literally changed the geography of, of Eastern France in World War I and turned it into a hellscape with their, the use of their weapons. Those, that would be contrary to the, just, the principle of just war. You could not use weapons that actually produce greater evils and disorders in the region that you're fighting over than the evil that you're eliminating. So, hmm. so you now you could doesn't mean you can't go and and you know fight and and drive out the aggressor, but you can't use weapons and you can't conduct warfare in a way that produces more evil than you're trying to eliminate. So, those are the four principles. So, when you look at those four major principles of what makes a war just, um, and if you want to if you want to look at them from a you know a simplistic perspective. One, you have to oppose a gravely harmful aggressor. Two, you, the war has to be a last resort. Three, you have to have a serious hope of success. And four, you can't make things worse. So that's the cheat sheet version of the, the four principles of just war. Um, in those cases, if you look at the, the Crusades, my contention is, and I'll leave this as a teaser because we're, we, we want to talk about the Third Crusade beforehand because that's the, the First Crusade kind of started the major crusades and the Third Crusade was kind of the last major crusade, although there were technically eight crusades. It was the third was the, the last major one um, that I'm sorry, it was I, I misspoke. Sorry about that. The third, the first and the third um, are the like the first the starting point and the midpoint of the crusade. So I want to talk about the third because it has a bunch of famous people in it that are um, that your listeners will know, like Richard the Lionheart and Saladin and others. So there's it's a fun one to talk about. Frederick Barbarossa, the the uh, red red beard, the the first um, German emperor, um, it, and uh, in or of that name anyway, and then uh, Philip of France, who is a who's a piece of work. And uh, Richard the Lionheart's um, rival, so it was a great crusade. But after we're done looking at that, I want to talk about like the, those four principles and apply them and say because I think a case can be made that the Crusades were actually just wars because they do fulfill those four principles. Um, right. There are some very interesting things that people don't know, especially about that last principle that war doesn't make it worse. Um, I will leave this with this teaser on that topic, which we can get into our next time. And that is that Muslims, there were, there's Muslim chroniclers who make the bold and, by the way, dangerous statement to make in their culture that the Crusader states were better under the Crusaders than they had been under the Muslim rulers that had ruled before the Crusaders took over. So, so um, and these are Muslim chroniclers. So, you know, I, th I think that we, I think that we tend to, especially now, we talk, we, we try and be very simple minded about things and paint things very, very black and white. Right. Yep. Uh, and that to think that, you know, there were Christians that were okay with it and the Christians that weren't okay with it. And there were Muslims that were okay with it. And the Muslims 
that weren't okay with it. I think that one of the biggest issues we have today is that, is that kind of like balkanization of opinions where you say, okay, well, this is a group of people and they all think this way. I mean, you kind of outlined it as well. Like there's this group of people that they're going on a crusade. Why are they doing it? Are some people doing it for land? Yeah, sure. there are some people that are doing it for land. And are there some people that are doing it because they're completely committed to their faith and they want to uh, uh, they want to get those plenary indulgences or, or whatever? Yeah. yeah. Are, are there people that just want to go out there and have revenge because of what is going on? Yes, life is complicated, right? Right, And to say that there are Muslim that's, that's true historians, of- right, that, that are like, hey, you know what? It was actually better under this, you know, under a Christian ruler um, yeah, for that 200 uh, ruler. Year period. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and I'm sure there are Muslims that say, you know, it was worse under Christians. So, uh, of course, you know, uh, and Christians that say that, you know, it was worse, worse under certain Christian rulers. Right. But so, the, I mean, the, the question that we have to ask ourselves is in that time, are we going to take people at, in other words, are we going to try to demonize everyone that was, that lived at a certain time in that place? Or are we going to take them um, seriously and understand that just like today, if you ask yourself following a certain terror event, a bunch of American sold, Americans sign up for war, what are their motivations? Um, there's going to be all sorts of motivations. Some of them, yeah, yeah. Some of them very, very patriotic and pure um, for defensive action or, um, you know, the destruction of an, of an enduring enemy of the United States, which who desires to kill us. Some of them impure, where they're going to they they just want to kill because they like killing, or they're they're doing it for personal gain in some way, you know, status or 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 um, uh, spoils of war such as they exist now, which is a little different from. But but this has been the case in throughout history. My point is the crusading armies actually were unusual in the fact that they rarely engaged in the kind of um, mm-hmm. slaughter that was per- pretty far for the course. In, in medieval warfare, um, and when well, the they... fact that they were they were told not to do it, or it was frowned upon, and yep. we have evidence of that. That yep. is a real thing. Like you have to take that into consideration. Yep. and that's the same. And I'm not going to again. I'm going to tease a little bit. It's the same about the Inquisition. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the Inquisition is a Inquisition is even more misunderstood than the Crusades. The Crusades, in one, in one sense, are very straightforward. They were a series of, of, of um, war, uh, wars perpetrated largely by religious authorities, or at least started, initiated by religious authorities in the West. And for, but what, I'm, what I want your listeners to take away, after all the long droning on and on, if they've made it through and they're, they're still awake, um, what, one of the things I'd want, I want them to joking, take, take okay. away, exactly. Well, I, I have that effect on people, I know. Um, the is that is that there's um these wars were fought primarily as defensive wars and everyone at the time knew it everyone at the time knew that it was the that the muslim kingdoms were the ones that were aggressors the muslims knew it and they said it proudly they said absolutely we're, we it, it's our mission to carry they wanted to do it that's to, what they wanted to, to do carry they wanted it, to spread islam carry I mean, the faith forward they, yeah. they they wouldn't take that as an insult they would admit that they were the aggressors in this so so the crusades were a uh, result of a call for help for from christian kingdoms and of the atrocity for the atrocities committed against um, people, uh, pilgrims to the holy city, which everyone across the medieval world recognized you were supposed, you were not supposed to kill pilgrims, no matter what faith they were, um, and no matter who was ruling Jerusalem. So when the Christians ruled Jerusalem after they took it over, they happily let Muslims, they not only let Muslims come in, they um, created whole places and, you know, um, uh, they... <laughs> They created whole structures and systems so the Muslims could peacefully worship at the mosques in Jerusalem. Um, it, it, so the, they, these were not spittle-flecked fl- uh, religious fanatics that just desired to kill Muslims. These were these were um, men who were largely speaking fighting a defensive war um, against an aggressor for what we would consider today legitimate purposes. And and so I that's what I want people to remember is that. This this the the maligning of the Crusades is ridiculous. 
Um, and Michael, I also think it's important to know a couple of things. Firstly, when they're going through and you're saying they're reclaiming what they saw as Christian land, that means it was filled with Christian people. Yep. So, or formerly Christian people. There were five minutes ago, and there no, they, and the Christians were still there. So, so yeah, and there was still, but but some there was some converts, right? Yep. Like, but but that's it was very recent. It's not like how we look at the world now and say, well, you know, these countries have been Islamic for you know x Centuries amount of years. And, it's yep. very very new. It's it's very very well, and, and, it, and when the Muslims came and they took those places that the Christians then freed in the first crusade, um, some of the places they freed were had been Muslim occupied for a, a long time for a century or more. A lot yeah. of them had not, and and um, frankly, but frankly, well, I guess that's a little bit of a pun, isn't it? Because it was the Franks yeah. in the first crusade, but. But frankly, they what they were doing was there, there were still a lot of Christians living there. There were Jews living there. There were Christians living there. There were Muslims living there. And really, when you were in the Holy Land at this time, it was like a revolving door. Like, who was going to be your ruler at, at, at any given time? Except the Jews never really conquered much of anything. They just sort of were always there. Uh, but, the, but whether your ruler had been Christian or had been a, a Fatimid Muslim or a Seljuk or a um, Abbasid or, or and, you know, whatever you were, um, um, or Morid or whatever, it doesn't matter. You there, the, you were just going to have a new ruler every few years, and because there, this was a time of constant warfare, and so this was not there was not like it was not a genocidal or racist or you know um, um, bigoted attack. This was a, a, a these wars were conducted as defensive wars because, yeah, and you have to remember the primary thing that they attacked was actually not Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the end point because of the atrocities against pilgrims but the first thing and most of their time was spent freeing the byzantine empire from its recent um d uh conquering by the seljuk turks so so this is not um and and this is and by the way you have the armenians who are there in that same region and they're christian and they they don't want the the most so so uh Utremer, which is the the that conglomeration of all those uh crusader states was large portions of the population was Christian. Um, some, a smaller portion was Jews and a large portion was Muslim. Um, and the, and when the uh, Crusaders took over, when the places they did, they ruled it. They ruled those places in a way that was as fair or more fair and, and, and in a way that was actually better for the people economically and, um, and religiously uh, from, from a toleration perspective. So, that's what's always funny to me as a as a medieval historian is when people think of the Crusades, they think of like these these uh, maniacs, like barbarians, just, just and, running through, but, wanting to slaughter all the Muslims. And that's you know, just you know what's so what's funny about truth. it. What's funny about it isn't. I was thinking about this as you were telling the story. Is that when we look at history, and certainly in this period of history, people tend to tiptoe around certain things for fear of offending groups but it's just history it's just history yep. right Good and point. you have to tell it the way it was and what's what's interesting is let's just say as i said you speak to some muslims they know exactly what happened through that period of time and they're totally fine with it because they were like this is what we do this is what we did right we 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 fought for our faith we wanted to exp – they don't have a problem with that. That's but right. we have a problem with that, discussing it. And then we kind of go, well, you know, we were the bad guys. Like we, It's it's a misunderstanding, and I know we've said this before, but I think it's very, very important to note that this is a misunderstanding of the time and the the rules of the time, as it were. You know yep. what I mean, Mike? Like what, what is expected at that time? Yep. Uh, I mean, the, we, we think about, I mean, this is, sorry, Mike, this is years and years ago. And when we think 100 years ago, people still go into the bathroom outside, right? So we've advanced so quickly, we we can't even comprehend yep. what life was like back then. It's true. It's true. And um, that that aspect where we have a hard time comprehending what life was like. And so as a default, we just say we don't care and we're and and we just want to hold them to our standards as if they were the, um 
That's unfair. We're all so better than them. Uh, we're so better than them. Which we're not. Now. Which we're not. Um, I mean, it's ridiculous, though, right? That that that's the kind of mentality we have. Yep. That it, I always think about this with. Um, sorry, just one quick segue. Sure. Um, when they talk about the witch trials, right? If you really thought that there was a witch that was cursing people, yep. Like if you genuinely thought that there was an evil witch that was cursing people, what would you do? Right. But now we kind of go, oh, it's ridiculous. Like whatever. It's ridiculous. But if you actually believe that that there's someone that could put someone's life in danger through um, some kind of non-physical means like witchcraft, um, then it was it would be actually um, it would be justifiable under a certain mode of thought to punish that person. And yeah. and what's interesting is like, and that's the whole. There's a whole issue about um, you know. Well, we'll get into this with the Inquisition. Yeah, but then, some, I mean, and then, and there's corruption of that, right? There's clearly corruption of that where you go, okay, well, I'm going to use this to get rid of people that I don't want. But but that goes for anything. Exactly right. But my, my, my point is, is putting yourself in the mindset of the individuals back then is absolutely crucial, or at least trying to understand the frame of reference uh, that we're talking about instead of putting our minds onto um, the situation back then is, is really silly. And I think the political correctness has gone a, a long way to, to ruin good conversations about things uh, so that we can look back. You know what they say is those that uh, don't know history are damned Dude. to repeat it, right? Repeat it, yeah. So we're not, we're not going back and examining these situations. Yeah, we seem have no a, desire to understand um, history. Uh, and that's what I want. I want folks to understand. And I, and I also want them to understand, if you want a soundbite, the Crusades were defensive wars. They were, the, the Crusaders did not go out and say, what Muslim lands can we take? Who can we slaughter? They were responding to centuries and decades, uh, recent decades of aggression and the fall of Christian lands unjustly by groups of Muslim um, kingdoms and uh, groups of Muslims in, in various kingdoms. And they were they were conducting a defensive war. Um, they did not desire to take over everything. They wanted to restore the Christian lands and protect the rights of pilgrims to worship in Jerusalem. And that was their their goal. And you can disagree with that, but the reality is these were defensive wars historically. And non, you know, the best uh, medievalist who's in recent memory who's written a book on this is no friend of Christians. Um, Thomas Asbridge is his name, British British author, wrote the definitive work just called The Crusades. It's in an early, he published it in the early 2000s. Um, he does fantastic work on this. And you will, when you read the cause for the Crusades in the beginning of his work, um, if your readers feel like, well, get the audio book because that's much better because you it's a long, it's a long one, this, this book. He's excellent at showing that, that the Crusaders did not, in fact, um, try to look at this as let's go get some land or let's go, you know, attack some Muslims. They really were putting their lives on the line in a defensive war. They, they viewed themselves as fighting defensively for religious tolerance, the ability to, for anyone to worship ultimately, but also for the freeing of the Byzantine empire, um, the Byzantine lands from their recent conquest by the, by the Muslims. And so, and in Iberia as well, in Spain, what we now call Spain. So, um, so that's the that's the reality. The 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 Crusades, as they were fought, the first Crusades especially were all were defensive wars, and that's what they thought they were. The people, and they were putting their lives on the line for that. And uh, and and I think reader people that um, want to understand the Crusades need to take keep that in mind. Michael, thank you so much. It was fascinating. We've yeah, done sorry, an hour, sorry, we, we, an hour and a half. And 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 we haven't even got onto the next one, but I, I want to thank you so much for sharing that. I'd like to ask the the audience, uh, please comment if you'd like us to go and talk about the Third Crusade. I think it would be great. And by the way, you know, we can talk about the, there was some naughty stuff that went on as well, uh, um, and yep. we can talk about that. And and what I really want to talk about as well was what life was like before and after the Crusades in those regions. Yep. So um, so please comment, like, and subscribe. I always have to say it. Michael, 
you're a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you so much for coming back again. I always love our conversations. Oh, By fun. the way, the, these are our conversations. Normally when we meet, we sit there and we have a glass of whiskey and, and we talk about everything, right? Exactly. You know, and that's the, those are the best kinds of conversations. So thank you for the time. Um, I'm, I'll be happy if our, if your listeners want to put a few questions in, I'll be happy to start our next talk with, you know, answering whatever questions they have about the crusades that, uh, and, and also I want to say you have a Tolkien podcast. I do. I, right. So do you want to, do you want to give that a little plug? Even nerdier than the crusades. So super nerdy. <laughs> so uh, for those that didn't listen to our previous podcast, I have a Tolkien podcast called Exploring Tolkien, and you can find it if you go to the one ring dot com. And uh, the, the gentleman that runs the site, Jonathan Watson, and I um, have a it's a co-hosted podcast. We talk every week. We go through everything from Tolkien's less explored works uh, to like the Silmar starting with the Silmarillion, but also all of his letters and unfinished tales and such. But also, and on his essay on fairy stories and other other works of his. Um, but we also uh, have reviews of everything from the uh, Rings of Power series, uh, the upcoming oh, upcoming. Sorry, exactly. sorry, it just, it just happens. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> um, to uh, there's an upcoming anime um, called War of the Rohirrim that we're we're gonna be, we're about to uh, um, talk about mm. in the coming weeks, and we also talk about we do, we go through. We're in the middle of the uh, the all of the film changes from the books, the Peter Jackson films, which are great films, but they did change a lot from the books. And so we are going we're in the process of going through the over 200 changes that he made to the books. Wow. Um, and we, we just cover a couple each week. And then when we get tired of that, we uh, we shift on to Tolkien's work. So if you want to be put to sleep by these dulcet tones talking about Tolkien instead of talking about medieval warfare, then you please join us over at uh, the one ring dot com. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so I'll have you back very soon, actually. Maybe we'll do it next week. We'll do another one. Could be. Uh, if, if, time, if time permits. And, um, always but lovely. It's always, it's always great to talk to you. And remember, I've got to say this. Remember, not all actors are like this. I promise. Thank God. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>